They were called the Black Robed Regiment and they played a critical role in American history. Who were they and what do we need to learn from them? Next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to the program. You know, it's likely you never heard the term black robed regiment and that's really too bad because this was a group of early American preachers who through their sermons and through their actions helped chart the course of American independence in the 18th century. The British actually coined the term because regiment is a military word for ground forces and supporting units in battle. And many preachers around that time of the Revolutionary War preached often about spiritual and civil liberty. And they also championed the rights of colonists for independence from Britain. The British therefore regarded these preachers as an enemy battalion. Well today, Greg Bogdan talks with Pastor Dan Fisher, who is dressed like one of those preachers from long ago, about the black robed regiment and why he feels it's time in our country bring them back. I have to tell you, um, I don't know that I've interviewed anybody in a robe like yours before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever been interviewed in a robe before, so there we go. <laughs> back in the 1700s, um, how would you say that most people got their information, their news? Oh, it was clearly the pastor. The church was the center of the culture in the 18th century, and the pastor generally was the most educated in the entire town. So he was the one who was the most up on what was going on. Right. You know, today we have so many separation of church and state and, you know, the difference between civil and religious liberties. Um, how was it back then? The founders considered separating civil and religious issues, separating those as being a very ungodly practice. Yeah. Of course, we're told today the exact opposite, and it's a myth of separation of church and state. So it would have been the exact opposite of what we see today. Hmm. Now, you're wearing a robe, and obviously there's something called the Black Robe Regiment. Yes. Uh, can you explain that for the audience? I'd be happy to. Well, you know, the pastors in those days, pretty much every denomination would preach uh, in robes on Sunday mornings. They'd, they'd wear black robes, and they'd wear these scarves. So it was, it was part of the style, part of the decorum of that time. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't matter whether you're Lutheran, uh, Presbyterian, Baptist. Generally, the preacher would be wearing a black robe. Huh. Well, they had been preaching that the gospel does more than address a person's salvation and their relationship to God. It, the gospel also addresses how you impact the world while you're here, as Jesus called being salt and light. So they believe that you couldn't compartmentalize your, your Christianity into the, the secular and the sacred. Everything was the same. So as these men would preach in their pulpits, they would preach about the biblical principles of government, justice, tyranny, all those different kinds of things. Well, once they really began to, to get too close for comfort for the British crown, uh, a, 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 an actual American who was a Tory, a British sympathizer named Peter Oliver, uh, came up with the phrase black robed regiment and it stuck and those guys kind of wore it as a, a badge of honor. Now, uh, Reverend John Muhlenberg was one of the well-known pastors at the time. Yes. Uh, tell us, give us a little history on him. Oh, okay. Well, he came from a long line of Lutherans. In fact, his father, Henry, was the father of the Lutheran Church in America. They were originally from Pennsylvania, and his name was John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, kind of a long title, but he went by Peter. In fact, his, his enemies called him Devil Pete because huh. as a young man, he had a pretty uh, fiery temper. Well, he was a Lutheran preacher in Woodstock, Virginia, but he also served in the Virginia House of Burgesses with George Washington and Patrick Henry. Yeah, so he had been preaching all these principles from his pulpit, and of course the tightening grip of tyranny from Great Britain was being felt by everyone, and the pastors were preparing their men to stand up if necessary, and he was one of those guys. Well, what is he most notable for? Well, what he's most notable for is on January the 21st, 1776, he had announced that that would be his final sermon as the pastor there in Woodstock. And what the members didn't know is that he had been recommended to be commissioned as a colonel to raise a new Virginia regiment. It's going to be a cavalry unit called the 8th Virginia. So here he preaches his sermon wearing his traditional black robe. But unknown to the congregation, he has on his colonel's uniform underneath the robe. 
and somewhere in the middle of his sermon, he steps off to the side and he removes his robe and there he has on his colonial soldier's uniform, a colonel's uniform. And what did that uniform look like? The colonel would normally wear a blue with a slightly tan or brownish colored lapel that would go down in the cuffs. Now you brought that uniform as well. Oh yes, I, I did. I, I really don't go anywhere without it. <laughs> So this is what Muhlenberg would have looked like when he was done removing his robe. Yeah, exactly. He would have been wearing this colonel's uniform. And, and you've got to imagine that the people are, are just amazed that they're standing there looking at their pastor right. now. Because they, they had kind of uh, just instantaneously stood and started singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Hmm. So there he stands and there they're singing. It would have been an amazing scene. Right. You know, it, it's interesting because it really shows the when I say aggressive nature, the, the bold nature of pastors at the time. Yes, yes. So let's talk a little bit about James Caldwell. Okay. Reverend James Caldwell. Give yes. me a little bit of history on him as oh, well. Oh yeah, sure. He, he is again one of the, the great guys in this whole story. And let me say that these guys are just kind of the tip of the iceberg. It wasn't just a handful of rebels, you know. Most of the pastors in New England did the very same things that, that Muhlenberg and Caldwell did. So let's talk about Caldwell. He's a Presbyterian. Muhlenberg's Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Caldwell's Presbyterian. Elizabethtown, New Jersey is where he pastored. And he was one of these fiery guys that would, it, it almost appears that he tried to infuriate the British. I mean, he'd say things like, sometimes it's as righteous to fight as it is to pray. And here he's a preacher. So the British put a bounty out on him. So he would go into the pulpit every Sunday wearing two loaded flintlock pistols. And he'd take them out and put them on the pulpit, preach his sermon, then put them back in his belt and go to the back and greet his people as they <laughs> left the church. And, and his people came to church iron, uh, uh, ironed, uh, uh, armed to the teeth because uh, they didn't know if the British were going to show up and try to arrest their pastor. Now what happened with his wife? Well, it's an amazing thing. They'd put the, the bounty out on, on uh, James himself. When the British invaded Elizabethtown, these soldiers many times were just turned loose into these towns. They would burn the churches. And one of the British soldiers saw Mrs. Caldwell through the window of her house. She knew, of course, that they were coming and she had tried to prepare the family. She had just finished nursing their baby. And the British soldier shoots her through the window and assassinates her right on the spot. Wow. Now, what about the statement, um, give them watts? Or yeah. Yeah, that, is that, that how is, it's said? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, what happens is when she's killed, Caldwell finds out, he rides back, he's not very far from where this happens, he rides back, does her funeral, and then wow. joins his men in Springfield, New Jersey, where they're fighting the British again. Well, in that fight, they run out of wadding for their muskets. Well, the wadding for a musket is critical, or the musket ball just kind of rolls out the other end of the barrel, you know. There's no pressure. There's no pressure, yeah. There's no concussion when, when the explosion goes off. So he jumps on his horse. He rides down to the First Presbyterian Church of Springfield, New Jersey, and grabs a bunch of Isaac Watts hymnals and goes back and throws the hymnals out to his men saying, tear out the pages and use them for wadding. So his soldiers are fighting the British, stuffing Isaac Watts hymns down the barrels of their muskets, firing at the British. And while they're doing that, Caldwell is yelling, give them Watts, boys, put Watts into them. And Dan, what do we use that term for today? Well, we still use it. It's just not the way that, that, that Caldwell said it. Many believe that our statement today, give them what for, actually comes from the Caldwell cry to give them Watts boys. Huh. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, Minister John Witherspoon uh, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Um, give us a little bit of history on him. Oh, John Witherspoon is amazing because not only did he sign the Declaration of Independence, he was one of the ones who lobbied in favor of its signing because, of course, you know that many of them were very hesitant because they knew what this meant. Right. I mean, this probably meant war at the worst, the gallows. When Franklin said, we have to hang together or we will most cer certainly hang separately, he wasn't kidding. Wow. meant that. Well, uh, Witherspoon was the only vocational pastor to sign the declaration, but he was also the president of Princeton University. Hmm. And he's the one who literally said that there was not an instance in history where civil liberty had been lost and religious liberty was preserved uh, completely. He understood that they were interwoven so that if you, if you remove one, you 
pretty much by definition moved the other. He, he understood the symbiotic relationship between these liberties. You know, it's interesting how closely tied our religious liberty is to our civil liberty. More on the Black Robe Regiment, including a story about the midnight ride of Paul Revere you've probably never heard before. We'll be right back. The church was the center of the society. It was the center of the culture. And these people were what, what we would call fundamental Christians. They were Orthodox Christians, and they believed the Bible to be God's Word. And so they just naturally believed that Jesus was their king, not some British king 3,000 miles away. Welcome back. Today we're learning about a group of patriot preachers from the Revolutionary War era known as the Black Robed Regiment. These men boldly talked about politics from the pulpit when faced with tyranny from the government under British rule. Oklahoma House Representative and Pastor Dan Fisher believes that it may well be time to bring back the principles these men embraced. He's concerned that these days too many preachers shy away from politics, even the moral aspects of politics, leaving their congregations biblically illiterate about the principles of good and godly government. Greg Bogdan continues the conversation with Dan, who is dressed in a colonel's uniform from the Revolutionary War. Paul Revere, you know, the great ride of Paul Revere, yes. everybody's heard about it. Uh -huh. um, tell us something we don't know. Oh, well, and this was a shock to me because, you know, here I go through school, I go through college. I was never told this. April the 18th, 1775, he's riding through the Massachusetts countryside. The regulars are coming. The regulars are coming. Because all of these colonists were British citizens. So they considered the, the uh, British Army the regulars. So he's yelling the regulars are coming. Well, he's going to Lexington because he knows that ultimately the British are going to go to Concord because that's where the rumor was all these munitions had been hidden. Right. Well, the, the citizens of Concord had already removed those so the British couldn't get them. But Revere is also aware that Pastor Jonas Clark has two special guests staying with him that night, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Well, Jonas Clark, the pastor, had been training the men of his church and the community how to fight together as a military group. And he was the trainer and the leader of the famous Lexington Minutemen. Hmm. So when, when Paul Revere is writing to Lexington, he's writing to the pastor's house, Jonas Clark. In fact, John Hancock's grandfather had pastored that very church. So that's why Revere is going there to warn Pastor Clark to get out the Minutemen to face the British that are marching in his direction. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Much of what we see today, I think we tend to see pastors kind of taking a step back from those type of civil, li yes. civil liberties. Oh, yeah. In fact, pastors today are retreating. The pastors in that era, number one, were the primary spokesmen. They were fighting the debate. And then when, when the debate was over, and you remember in the Declaration, they, they enumerated how they had tried everything. They would exhausted every option that they felt they had before them. Then the pastors led out in the actual fighting. Ironically, the first shot of our War of Independence occurred in Lexington in what we would call the churchyard of Jonas Clark's church. Hmm. So the first battle for our War of Independence happens in a churchyard. It was the gathering house there in Lexington, the meeting house. Now at the start of the Revolutionary War, what was it the British said to the rebels and how did they respond? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, is, is recorded in the accounts is that there in Lexington, the, the, the British officer rides up and tells them to throw down their arms, you rebels in the name of the King of England. We, we don't have recorded what their actual response was, but one of the very popular phrases in that day was, we have no king but King Jesus. And so that was, that was a recurring refrain because as we said at the beginning of this interview, the church was the center of the society. It was the center right. of the culture. And these people were what, what we would call fundamental Christians. They were Orthodox Christians and they believed the Bible to be God's Word. And so they just naturally believed that Jesus was their king, not some British king 3,000 miles away. So you would like to bring back the Black Robe Regiment. Yes. To you, you know, what, how do you, you know, practically speaking, how does that work itself out? I mean, what is a preacher today 
Uh, what does that mean? I'm, I'm not advocating another war, right. but I am advocating a return to the spirit of those pastors. Here's, here's the way I say it. The pastors and the church presided over the sunrise of liberty in North America. If the pulpit and the church does not reawaken, we're going to preside in the 21st century over the sunset of liberty in North America. And I really believe that. I've spent a lot of time researching this. I've written on it, spent two years researching and writing the history of these guys. And it doesn't make me an authority, but I've spent a good deal of time. And so my hope is that we can reawaken the pulpit, get pastors to begin to boldly speak out as their ancestors did, and revive this sleeping giant that we call the church. I mean, you do, you've done a ton of study on this. What's your opinion on where we'd be today in America um, with our religious liberties had these men not stood for what they stood for back then? Well, we would be under the thumb of the Anglican Church. We'd be under the thumb of the Church of England. Now, of course, it's hard to, to say what would have happened in the ensuing 200 plus years, but that's where we would have been. We, we would not have the liberties that we enjoy today. We, we would not be able to express our religious beliefs the way we do now, unless of course there'd been a revolution later on, right. but that's what we would be. We would be Anglican, we would be the Church of England, and we would be following the dictates of the King. Do you believe if, uh, I mean, where do you think we're going if we don't stand up as a, as a church today? Well, that, that's a scary thought to me because what it appears to me is that we are headed towards some type of socialist country, which is deplorable, number one, because it, it doesn't work anywhere. Uh, secondly, it's not a biblical form of government. But, but thirdly, it's going to strip us of our rights. And, and I think that it's moving quicker than, than we may think it is. You know, right now, the Internal Revenue Service is really flexing its muscles and right. trying to put the fear of God into churches and pastors. They're, they're going through our information. Now, they can't find certain emails, but they can find yours and mine. They're trying to put the pressure on, but even outside of that, churches are being zoned out of the ability to build parking lots. They're being censored in every way. People expressing their religious beliefs and standing against certain practices that they believe the Bible teaches is a sin uh, to, to practice. They're being penalized, fined, forced to embrace these kinds of things. We are headed down a very difficult road if we don't speak up while we can speak up. So one of the earliest attempts to silence the religious freedom at the time was the Johnson Amendment. Can you explain that to us a little bit? Lyndon B. Johnson, who later became president after uh, President Kennedy's assassination, was running for his second term as senator in Texas. And there were con some, some conservative groups that were claiming that he was involved with communists. Well, he had to shut them up and he had to do it quickly. So what he did is he used his clout in the Senate to... Uh, augment the tax laws to add into it that churches and conservative groups could not speak in favor of or against candidates. And it was unconstitutional. It was then, it is now. Right. But it was used as a stick to threaten churches and pastors. Of course, it, it shut up those conservative groups and he was consequently reelected. But over the years now, it has become the lever that the, the government is using against the church. And the amazing thing is, the last time I checked, a pastor wasn't a church. The pastor doesn't shed his First Amendment rights just because he's the pastor of a church. Right. So, you know, therein lies the real debate. So as we're concluding today, um, if you had one challenge you could give to Christians and especially to Christian leaders in America, what would it be? My challenge would be to hold the truth high, to preach the whole gospel, not just the convenient part of it, and stop worrying about how it's going to affect your attendance, your offerings, the size of your square footage, those kinds of things, but preach the truth while we still can because if we keep retreating, those who do not believe the scriptures and who are wicked will take every inch that we give them and ultimately we'll paint ourselves into such a corner like Dietrich Bonhoeffer experienced in Germany where there's nowhere to go but the concentration. Ben Fisher speaks around the country and has written a couple of volumes on this subject. And you can find out more and get your copy of the books at bringingbacktheblackrobedregiment.com. When we return, final thoughts on leaving captivity for freedom. We'll be right back. Every time we leave captivity and head to freedom, there's going to be a crisis because there's going to be spiritual opposition. It's kind of like being stuck between a rock and a hard place.
Welcome back. The goal of liberty, of freedom, is a principle that our founders sought and that many died to establish for our country. Carl Clausen, currently the morning radio host on WMBI 90.1 FM, talks about leaving a different kind of captivity for freedom in today's final thoughts. There's no greater adventure in the spiritual life than leaving captivity and heading headlong toward real spiritual freedom. But I want to give you an important aspect of heading to freedom that you need to know so that when when you hit it, you're not going to be thrown for a loop and derailed. Every time we leave captivity and head to freedom, there's going to be a crisis because there's going to be spiritual opposition. It's kind of like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Exodus 14 gives us a picture of the nation of Israel coming out of captivity and heading to freedom. But they stood at this crisis, and it's a faith crisis that you're going to face, just like Israel did. And it's just like this. When we head out, uh, maybe we're leaving an addiction behind, uh, some kind of a behavior in our life that we know that we've got to get rid of. Maybe it's a group of friends that we're just getting distance from. At this crisis point, we're going to get hit and stand right between what seems impossible and something that seems absolutely improbable. That's the rock and the hard place. See, for Israel, Moses was confronted by a group of people who said, what's going on here? We got, we got Pharaoh's army coming out to kick our tail, and now we're stuck. What were they stuck between? They were stuck between the passing over some water that looked impossible and the beating back of an army that was totally improbable. That's where you're at. Whenever you leave captivity and head to real freedom, you're going to hit these crisis moments. But here's the silver lining. God is doing something in that moment. He's doing the same thing in your life that He did in the nation of Israel. He wants to prove to you that the Lord will fight for you and you only have to be silent. You see, it's in these rock and a hard place moments, the impossible and the improbable, where God wants to seal up and confirm that He's taken us out of captivity and leading us into freedom. So in that moment, when you feel like, I'm about to get my tail kicked spiritually, or I'm going to get swallowed up by this sea in front of me, know this. Stop, pause, drop to your knees, allow God to speak to you in that moment because I don't know what it'll be. I don't know if it's the beating back of that army that's chasing you or the opening up of the water in front of you, but this I am certain of. Be silent and God will deliver. That's our God. So the hope for today is this. You leave captivity. You go ahead and head to freedom and watch God blow your mind while you're at this crisis of faith. I promise you, He will. Thanks, Carl. Good word. Uh, you know, if I would use the term limited freedom, a lot of people would have, especially today, especially young people, could have a problem with that. But it's through limited freedom that we really have freedom. Every one of us, both in secular life as well as our spiritual life, have to have boundaries. There's places that we have to make decisions that we won't go, things that we won't do. When we read the Bible, the Bible gives us boundaries. And if we somehow believe that we have absolute freedom with no boundaries, then we lose our freedom. Our nation can't survive unless there are boundaries. And in the United States, we call that rule of law. Spiritually, we call that obedience to God's purpose and will for our lives. So in every one of us. We need to have boundaries, and we need to establish those boundaries and make sure we stay within them. Thanks for joining me. God bless.